Welcome to Our Savior's Lutheran Online Worship. I'm Pastor Bridgette Weir, and it's a joy to be together today. Today is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. A few things that will help us in our time together online today. If you would like a bulletin, you can go to our website, um, oslcslc.org, and download or print that off. On that website as well, you will also find our e-news with all of the um, things that we are working on together as a congregation at this time to support the community around us, particularly our ministry partners of Family Promise and Urban Crossroads, Linus Project, etc. Please go to our e-news to see how you can help your neighbor at this time. And also you will find our online giving button on our website. It's a wonderful way to continue our mission and ministry of being God's hands and feet in the world when God needs us most to step up as the beloved community. A reminder, kids, that after this worship, we will be also recording a children's worship. You won't want to miss that and see what kind of zany thing Teacher Mike's going to do next. And then know that next week we do enter into Holy Week with Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday culminating in Easter. Those will also be recorded and put on our YouTube channel for you to worship together as a family or in your household, knowing that nothing, including digital spaces, keeps us from one another or the love of God. And so as we enter into worship this morning, let's do so with a moment of silence before we start with our opening song. God, we know you are present. And we sing together, how great is our God. Singing with me, how great is 
together. God of life, you unbind us and set us free for resurrection life. You call us each by name with love and care. We entrust our days to you, God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with our Kyrie. After each petition, you will respond, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We continue with our gospel acclamation, which is Holy Spirit come to us. We will get a bit of a lead in and then we will sing it through twice. Holy Spirit, come to us. 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 Our gospel reading comes from John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Beginning with verse 1, going to verse 44. We get the story today of the raising of Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after, he said, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's falling asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, 
let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, will die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming to the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked, up, looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So one of my favorite games to play when I'm ruminating on a situation that I'm really unhappy about or uncomfortable with is the if only game. Maybe you play this game too. You know, the one where you have like a fender bender and you think, ugh, if only I had looked left instead of right, or if only that person had stayed in their lane, or if only I had stayed home, then all the unpleasantness could have been avoided. Part of how we're wired as human beings is to be constantly vigilant on how to stay out of danger and to be safe. And so when danger does arrive on our doorsteps, as it invariably does, we want to dissect the events leading up to the misfortune, figure out who to blame, how we can avoid this unpleasantness again, and even figure out how to change the present misfortune so maybe we don't have to continue to endure any of the consequences. This line, if, if only, thinking blows us into the falsehood 
that we have some sort of control over life events and that we can logic or bargain our way to happiness, safety, and security. I mean, don't get me wrong, we should try and make appropriate decisions and not put ourselves in harm's way, but we also know that there's no such thing as perfection. We can technically make every correct decision and take every prudent action and still have traumatic events befall us. And we've all seen the inverse of that too, haven't we? When it seems that someone makes poor decision after poor decision and still everything seems to come out all right for them, what is that, right? It can be maddening as we attempt to try to discern any pattern or consistency or logic out of life events. Mary and Martha and even the disciples in this story are knee deep in the if only game in our John 11 story this week. Jesus gets word that Lazarus, brother to Mary and Martha, is very ill. And Jesus just sort of seems to brush off this news in a cavalier sort of way that I have to admit to you is really hard for me to understand. I mean, I really want Jesus to just drop everything and rush to Lazarus's bedside and save him from whatever pain and suffering he is experiencing. But Jesus doesn't do that. He hangs out where he is for two more days. And then all of a sudden, Jesus does decide to go to Bethany, where Mary and Martha were. But again, I wonder, why the wait? I just don't understand. Jesus arrives there to Mary and Martha's to find what I've always envisioned as a bit of a wake happening. I mean, family and friends are gathered, lamenting, crying, telling stories of the deceased, eating, praying, visiting the grave, all of the things that you would expect to participate in when a loved one dies. It's an interesting that the gospel writer John does let us know that the Jews, whom we have to remember in John's gospel are the authorities, are here. Were Lazarus or Mary and Martha important somehow? Were they a prominent family? Or was it they, were, they knew that they were close to Jesus and they thought this was another opportunity to see what Jesus might be up to? It could be any or all of those things. We really just don't know. But I get the sense that their present perhaps, the presence wasn't perhaps all that altruistic. And I think Jesus knows it. Martha met Jesus on his way to the village, and the first words out of her mouth were, if you had been here. Martha was probably replaying the sickness and death of her beloved brother over and over in her mind. And now seeing Jesus physically present was another piece for her in her attempt to make sense of this senseless experience. Jesus, if only you had done what I wanted you to do. Jesus doesn't offer Martha any platitudes here of God needed another angel or this was God's will. He didn't even offer an I'm sorry that Lazarus died. Jesus simply states, your brother will rise again. Now Martha's response is less surprising than we might think, as there was a, a strand of Jewish theology that did believe in the resurrection, but it wasn't how we think of the resurrection today as followers of Jesus in the 21st century. What happened in that Jewish strand of theology is more what happens in uh, Judgment Day or the Day of the Lord in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus knows this and gently offers that there is more to it than that, Martha. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, not just someday in the future, but the life right here, right now. And even when we wonder, if only, and even when we don't like or understand our circumstances, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Martha then goes and gets her sister Mary, and the Jews follow her as she too then goes to Jesus. Ironically, or perhaps predictably, Mary's first words to Jesus are the same as Martha's, if you had been here. Jesus sees her tears, sees the Jews crying as well, and then gets mad. 
The gentle translation we have of greatly disturbed does not do justice to the Greek, which means indignation. Jesus is angry. He is angry and he's moved and he's overcome with all of these emotions just as we are all at once. Maybe he's angry that the Jewish authorities are using Lazarus' death for their own gain. Maybe he's angry that death is part of his dear friend's existence at all. Maybe he's moved to tears that this is humanity's reality before him. But Jesus is moved to tears. Jesus, too, has many emotions swirling in him, and he's feeling the emotions of those around him. Because we have a God who cries with us in sorrow and who gets angry with us as well. Jesus goes to the tomb. And then when he says to roll away the stone, Martha interjects that is a bad idea, Jesus. Lazarus has been dead long enough that there will be the stench of death in the air. But then Jesus offers his own if statement. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Jesus then prays to God and calls Lazarus by name, and Lazarus emerges from the tomb, bound in his death wrappings. Jesus says to those present, unbind him from those trappings of death and let him go. We find ourselves in a time when we are asking ourselves and God a lot of if questions, aren't we? If someone had contained the virus sooner, if we could figure out how to cure it or to treat it, if we weren't so vulnerable from it, if this wouldn't affect the economy, if this didn't require so much sacrifice, if we weren't so afraid and uncertain that Jesus comes to us in our ifs and offers us belief. And I want to be clear, believing isn't some naive assent to wishful or magical thinking. It's not like those prayer forwards we get on Facebook where it says if you forward this to 10 friends, then your prayers will be answered. It's not like that, right? This is about Jesus coming to us. And belief is a lot like love in that way and that it's always there. It is tenacious and it is foundational in our lives. Believing is how we orient our vision and our hearts to living in painful times and in suffering. Believing doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen to us, but what believing does mean is that we will see God at work even when it only looks like death and smells like death. You will see our God who takes our chaos and our ifs and will bring order to it. You will see how God takes our attempts at logic and control and reminds us that there is more than we can see. Through Jesus, we are freed from those ifs of our lives. Jesus unbinds us from our ifs to freedom, to community, to service, and to love. We are freed to hear Jesus call our names, and then we unbind each other as Lazarus's friends unbound him in community for life, life that is not certain, but life where hope is alive and present through Jesus Christ. We believe because of Jesus' love, and we look for abundant life and possibility where others might see finality and despair. We believe so that we see the opportunities before us as a congregation and individuals to unbind each other from fear and death to freedom for the sake of being this abundant life and freedom in our community. In the coming days and weeks and probably months, we will be called in this freedom to serve our community in ways that we probably have never imagined, friends. But we are God's people unbound not stuck in the ifs, but freed to the reality of God's love and presence no matter where we are, no matter how isolated we might physically be, nothing can separate us from God's love. And so we believe and we shed the trappings of death for life eternal. Amen.
We will sing the song, You Are My King. I join with me as we confess our faith in this triune God that brings life from death in the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Take a sip of water. For our prayers of the people today, these are all prayers that have been submitted throughout the week, um, either to me personally on email or through our Facebook page, Our Savior's Lutheran Salt Lake City. You can find us there. Um, please, if you have prayer requests, note that these will be read out loud as part of this worship experience today. I invite you to pray with me. Good and gracious and life-giving God, we ask that you hear these prayers and cries of our hearts today. God, we know that you call us each by name and unbind us to be your beloved community. God, we pray for our first responders and for our medical staff and personnel at this time. God, we pray for patience and courage for us all as we pull together as one people for the greater good. May we be unbound and freed at this time to do what it takes God to care for one another. God, Rich offers this prayer this morning. O oh, Jesus, protector, defender of all harm, keep our family safe and close together during this time of health emergency. Wrap your arms around us as we know you will always be with us. Lynn once again offers a prayer for Kinzen, who's having another biopsy to determine what treatment can be done. God, hold them as they await that result and let Kinzen know that she is beloved always. God, we pray for Sharon this morning at the death of her mother, Grace. God, we know that you are indeed the resurrection and the life, and God, we ask that you hold Sharon and her family in the palm of your hand this day. God, due to the circumstances of the epidemic, the pandemic, we know, God, that this is complex grief, that funerals will be far off, closure will be far off, and God, we ask for your healing and your comfort at this time. God, we also pray for um, a, her brother's mother-in-law in Phoenix who passed away as well. God, we know that this is a time of deep sorrow, and we pray for all who do travel to be with family. Keep them safe and protect them from all harm, God. God, we pray for peace and comfort for Janice and Bruce as they continue to mourn the death of their daughter, Rachel. God, this week was her birthday when she would have turned 36. God, may they know that you hold them as well in the palm of your hand. God, we, we lift up to you all of the joys and sorrows God, this is a time of complexity and uncertainty. Remind us that as your people, we are free to love. We are free to be who you created us to be, to act out of that love and freedom, and to cast our fears upon you, because your love, God, perfectly casts out all fear. God, and we now join together in the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And God, trusting in your promises, we now sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Oh 
today and again to Bob Ritchie for the recording. Very grateful. Even in a time of pandemic, it still takes a village to make a worship service complete and to be uh, joyful and to go out to all of you. So we know that we are in this together. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with all favor and grant you peace in the name of the creator and of the sustainer and of the redeemer. Amen. And now go in peace. Jesus calls your name. Go and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.